everyone. I'm sad that I'm not with you to present this paper in person and that I didn't get to hear all the wonderful papers from the conference, but I'm also very happy and grateful to be able to participate on some level. So thank you for that. Okay, here we go. Seeing female readers, reading female readers, making meta readers. Montgomery as depictor and creator of scholars. In Anne of the Island, Aunt Jimsy is talking to Anne about Philippa Gordon and says, I love her, but I can't understand her. She beats me. She isn't like any of the girls I ever knew or any of the girls I was myself. How many girls were you, Aunt Jimsy? Anne responds. About half a dozen, my dear. Ella Montgomery's characters are many types of girls. Some are thinkers, some are doers, some are indoorsy, some are outdoorsy. Most are dreamers. Nearly all are readers. Anne is a reader. Indeed, this exchange with Aunt Jimsy happens while Anne is away at university, reading and studying much of the time. We know Anne is a long-standing reader because as a child, she often cites things she, quote, read in a book, and we hear about Anne being punished for reading Ben-Hur during class a book that was lent to her by Jane Andrews, alongside another book lent to her by Ruby Gillis. The all-too-often-overlooked Diana is first described as, quote, sitting on the sofa reading a book when she meets Anne, and Diana's mother subsequently comments that she reads entirely too much, always poring over a book. Outside the Anne series, Valency's devotion to nature books changes the entire course of her life, and we suspect she enjoys them, even though, quote, a book that was enjoyable was dangerous. And I have to laugh for a moment here, because normally at this point in the conference, there's like two or three quotes that everybody has used in their papers, but sadly, I don't know what those are, so I may just use them and not know it. Sorry. Anyway, as others have also noted, Emily is a reader, all the girls at Patty's Place are readers, all the Avonlea girls are readers, Rilla is a reader, and though Sarah Stanley is not a reader per se, we know her life is surrounded by stories and storytelling. Some theorists have argued that reading is a passive endeavor. You absorb the thoughts of the author as you sit in your stationary environment. But those of us who, like Montgomery's heroines, read avidly, know that reading is a much more active endeavor than it appears. We engage our minds, emotions, thoughts, and imaginations when we read. We may discuss what we read with family, with friends, with our book groups, either online or in person, with classmates, with students, with bookstagrammers. And for anyone who isn't familiar, Bookstagram is an entire segment of Instagram devoted to talking about books, and Instagram is a lively subset of that discussion. In addition to discussing what we read, many readers are prompted to take action, social, political, scholarly, based on what they read. Therefore, reading is, by definition, an activity. Now, if you've seen me speak before, you know I'm big on audience participation, so here's our first little group activity. I'd like you all to close your eyes, and I promise I won't do anything weird up here while they're closed, but if you don't trust the people around you, you can squint a little. But at least partially close your eyes and picture what I'm reading while I read this passage that describes Patty's place from Anne of the Island. Eyes closed. What a dear place it was. Another door opened out of it directly into the pine grove, and the robins came boldly up on the very step. The floor was spotted with round braided mats, such as Marilla made at Green Gables, but which were considered out of date everywhere else, even in Avonlea. And yet here they were on Spofford Avenue. A big polished grandfather's clock ticked loudly and solemnly in a corner. There were delightful little cupboards over the mantelpiece, behind whose class doors gleamed quaint bits of china. The walls were hung with old prints and silhouettes. In one corner, the stairs went up, and at the first low turn was a long window with an inviting seat. Please open your eyes. I ask you to consider, what color are the braided mats? What pieces of china are in the cabinet? Teacups, teapot, what are their patterns? What do they look like? What colors do they include? 
What do the pictures on the wall show? What is the view out the window? If you're like me, you already have answers to all of these questions, answers that are completely your own. Even though the words on the page are identical for everyone who reads or hears them, the picture in your mind is completely yours. You have manufactured that image as a result of hearing Montgomery's words. So in the act of reading, you, we, all of us, transition from receiver to creator. You created that image in your mind's eye based on Montgomery's influence. As a result, I think it's safe to say that reading is a creative endeavor in itself, but that creativity is heightened when readers transition into writers, scholars, artists, crafters, or anyone else who creates a physical product based on an image in their mind. Montgomery's characters model this transition beautifully. Nearly all of them begin as readers. Many become creators in their own right as an extension of their reading. Anne, at least initially, is both reader and writer, as are Diana, Jane, and Ruby, through their book sharing and their participation in the story club. And I hope I'm not the only one who absolutely loves that scene in Anne of Avonlea where Anne is stuck armpit deep in the duck house because she stood on the roof to peek in the window and fell through. And while she's there, she imagines a most interesting idea for a story that she absolutely must write down right that instant, quote, because I dare say I'll forget the best parts before I get home. And so she wrote out her garden idyll under conditions that could hardly be considered as favorable to literature." Unquote. Now that's a devotion to writing. And Emily, of course, is the quintessential reader turned writer. In the Tansy Patch chapter of Emily of New Moon, Emily writes to her father about having read Little Red Riding Hood, and then about two poems she herself has written, as if writing about the reading and about the writing are all natural extensions of the same activity flowing back and forth seamlessly, writing, reading, writing. My point here is that Montgomery, through her creation of active readers of her books, and through the reader-to-writerly journey of her heroines, models the reader-to-writerly journey for and of her readers. I argue that, in so doing, Montgomery creates scholars and artists I'd like to say a little more about how this happens. I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that when we read about book characters who are themselves reading, those characters often stand in for us as readers in the world of the book. That is, because they're readers, and we're readers, we see ourselves in them, and we live through them. I myself often put female readers in my fiction manuscripts, because I remember so fondly that moment of reading a book as a child and coming across a bookish heroine and thinking, oh, she's like me. And it's a safe bet, right? Because if a person is reading your book, that person, by definition, is a reader. The terms for this in literary theory are metafiction and meta-reader. From the Greek meta, to think about, Meta-reading and metafiction is reading that makes us think about the act of reading while we're doing it. It's self-conscious reading. And as a narrative strategy, this can be risky. It's a sort of breaking the fourth wall to nod at the reader and say, see this girl here reading? She's like you, and we see you out there reading too. It runs the risk of rupturing the fictional facade. But when done successfully, I would argue that it actually removes the invisible wall between reader and book and makes us feel like we're one. We're in the book. We're not just reading about Anne, Diana, Valency, or Emily. We're reading with Anne, Diane, Valency, and Emily, and sometimes even reading as them, but with our own mental narrative that we produce as co-creators of their fictional worlds. So when Montgomery then illustrates her heroine's shift from reader to writer, scholar or artist, 
she nudges the reader to make the same transition. You can think of this as reader response turned into writer response. Anne at Redmond, reading Pickwick and studying for her high honors in English, becomes our role model for ourselves as scholars of her work. Emily, as a writer, becomes the writer in all of us struggling to get out. And whatever ambivalent feelings we may have for Kevin Sullivan, and I have many, we cannot deny that he reproduces, or re-reproduces, or re-meta-produces, many visual images of Anne as reader and writer, and even inserts some new ones, such as Anne reading as when she's supposed to be taking Mr. Hammond his lunch, which becomes the opening scene and benchmark for his entire film production. True confession, I haven't been able to bring myself to watch Anne with an E yet, because I just don't know what it's going to be like, so someone will have to tell me if that Netflix production does the same thing. All of these instances collectively demonstrate that Montgomery not only depicts readers, but through her crafty identification with the reader as reader, and subsequent transition of her reader heroines into scholars and writers, she models that transition for all readers. And that work is replicated in numerous visual adaptations of her work that re-re-reproduce the image of woman as reader, writer, scholar, and creator. Now it's time for a little more audience participation, so shake yourself off and get ready to get vocally active. Um, this may seem random, but I'd like you to think of two or three superheroes for a moment. And you can define that term however you'd like, so think of a couple of superheroes. Okay, got them in your head? Now, I'd just like you to yell out a few examples of superheroes. Just yell them out. Come on. I hope you're actually yelling, because I can't tell. Okay, good. Thank you. So we might ask at this juncture, what do superheroes have to do with readers and writers in Ellen Montgomery's work? And since we're still in audience participation mode, go ahead and say that out loud with me. What does this have to do with Ellen Montgomery? Okay, so say it with me. You ready? What does this have to do with Ellen Montgomery? One more time. What does this have to do with Ellen Montgomery? I am so glad you asked. From the time I first thought about this essay back last summer and kept thinking about it throughout the year, I kept coming back to the concept of the origin story. And I was thinking about origin stories in two respects. Culturally, origin stories tell how humankind came to be, or how a particular cultural group of people came to be. Hawaiian oral history says that Maui fished the Hawaiian islands up from the ocean, a story that we then see reproduced in the Disney film Moana. That's an origin story. The book of Genesis, quote, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, unquote is an origin story. The story of Adam and Eve and the creation of humankind is a Christian origin story. The Iroquois story of the girl who fell from the sky and came to rest on the back of the great turtle, who in turn became the earth, is an origin story. These are all examples of culturally specific origin stories, and virtually every culture on earth has one or more origin stories. In pop culture, and specifically in comic book culture, the origin story tells how the superhero became a superhero. So think back to your superheroes for a minute. Peter Parker became Spider-Man because he was bitten by a radioactive spider that gave him special powers. Superman became Superman by being hurled to Earth just before the destruction of his home planet Krypton. Wonder Woman actually has a few different origin stories, but most suggest that she's a powerful woman of divine and or royal origin, raised in an Amazonian culture, who then emigrates to the United States to fulfill her destiny fighting evil. So what does this have to do with Ellen Montgomery? Here's the thing. Every Ellen Montgomery scholar that I've ever met has an Ellen Montgomery origin story. When and how did you first fall in love with Ellen Montgomery's work? What's your recollection of first reading Ellen Montgomery? When did you know it was love? And if you're a scholar or creator, when did you know you first wanted to do
scholarly or creative work on Ellen Montgomery. When and how did you turn that corner from Montgomery reader to Montgomery writer? These are our Montgomery origin stories. Many Montgomery scholars include their origin stories in their scholarly works. I know how Elizabeth Everly fell in love with Montgomery's works and became a Montgomery scholar because I've read her books. Because I've read Gabrielle Almanson's work, I know not only her Montgomery origin story, but the Montgomery origin story of the first Swedish translator of Montgomery's work. What's more, telling these stories in the act of scholarship replicates the meta-reader experience within Montgomery's own novel. That is, these scholars are not just offering interpretations of Montgomery's work, but also offering the story and image of themselves reading Montgomery's work. If I may riff on Catherine Sheldrick Ross's title, Readers Reading Ellen Montgomery, these are readers reading, meta-reading, and meta-meta-reading Ellen Montgomery. Or to put it another way, re-representing the act of reading as they read. Insert Hall of Mirrors here, as my friend used to say. If I have the time, we do a massive audience participation and everyone go around the room and share their Montgomery origin stories, and I wish I was there to hear them. But in the meantime, I'd like to suggest that this concept of the Montgomery origin story, these tales we tell of how we came to be Montgomery readers, scholars, and creators is something distinct to Montgomery's work. It may not be unique, but then again, it's not common among other authors. I've been in Jane Austen classes and attended Jane Austen panels, but I've only ever heard a couple Jane Austen origin stories. I specialized in American literature, but I have never heard a Hemingway or Melville or even an F. Scott, Scott Fitzgerald origin story but I have heard dozens and dozens of Montgomery origin stories and hope to hear hundreds more within my lifetime. In my opinion, that's no coincidence. I believe we have Montgomery origin stories in part because Montgomery wrote us that way. She modeled our scholarly and creative futures through the way she wrote her characters as readers and writers and through the way she crafted our response to them. We, as readers and scholars, are the Montgomery superheroes with our own origin stories. And our good deed, indeed our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to go forward and to write her back. In every piece of scholarship produced about Montgomery's work, in every bookstagram post praising or questioning or discussing Montgomery, in every classroom paper, in every book group talk, in every novel, in every painting, in every cotton warp or tulip pattern quilt, we are crafting the legends of Montgomery for all time. So I charge you, Montgomery readers and Montgomery superheroes, to go forth from this conference and create. Thank you so much.